Greetings, everyone. Dr. Kelly Moran here, ready to kick things off with our first recorded video lecture for our class, Assessment and in Reading Instruction. Uh, the purpose of today's presentation is to kind of acquaint you with the course, help familiarize you with some key terms we're going to be talking about, give you a background on assessment, and give us a little touch point in terms of helping us understand the how and why of assessment, not just giving literacy assessments, but why we give them and how they came to be. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, we just want to cover today that there is a large range of assessment tools and practices out there. They're used differently for different reasons, and we want to go further into understanding how to give those assessments, but more so understand the why behind those assessments. So at this point in time, if you have not already watched ODE, the Ohio Department of Education's video on the simple view of reading, I want you to pause this and actually go watch that video first. So this video is also referenced in our syllabus for the same date as watching this video lecture, I believe. But I want you to watch that simple view of reading video first because I think it gives you the appropriate background knowledge to understand why we assess the way that we do nowadays. In addition to giving you the background knowledge on what the simple view of reading is, you're also watching it because many of you in this course are educators in Ohio. And if you are not already familiar, Ohio has a plan to raise literacy achievement. It is a 50 page document that's already gone through one revision and it outlines how literacy should be taught in this state, how we should be assessing literacy, how to provide interventions for literacy, and PD support for teachers, as well as parent engagement. The whole plan is aligned to the simple view of reading. So if you're an educator or an instructional leader in the state of Ohio and you're not familiar with the plan and or the simple view of reading, your actions could likely be um, incongruent or out of lockstep with what ODE is prescribing to us. On the screen now, what you see is the simple formula of the simple view of reading. It's a multiplication equation, and it's designed that way for a reason, because reading comprehension is the product of these two components, decoding and language comprehension. If there is a deficit or a zero in one of those factors, then reading comprehension does not exist to its full capability. Now, this is the simple view. It's important to remember that both the decoding and language comprehension encompass several micro skills. And we'll take a look at a diagram later on that shows what some of those skills are. So I, um, this is the simple view, but I also want to always give that disclaimer that within this simple view, those two components, there are a lot of sub skills that take place. I try to integrate the simple view as much as possible within this course. Again, that'll help you as daily practitioners match your actions and procedures in schools or tutoring or virtually or as a parent. It'll help you align those practices with the state's plan. So today we're going to go through a historical perspective on reading research as it relates to assessment and I'm going to cover some key terms and ideas in the presentation which I can share with everybody. This image of Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement is actually linked to the actual document if you want to take a look at it which I highly encourage that you do. So let's take a look at history. How did we get here? Well, the story begins in the 20th century when progressives began to call for student growth models of education. 
So prior to that, education was merely thought of to help achieve two things. One, to prepare people for participation in organized religion, and two, for social political life. So therefore, prior to the progressives, reading was largely seen as a skill that held value in its usefulness. Recitation and copying were used to develop these limited skills. Think of this. In colonial America, a citizen need largely to be able to read the Bible and sign a deed. But beyond that, reading was simply a luxury. As our society advanced, however, the demands for reading did increase. Schools were there to assimilate American society and give learners functional skills. John Dewey and others began to vision a school system that was designed to foster independent students student-centered thinking. And this had large implications on reading pedagogy because reading was no longer seen as a passive act, but as one that is supposed to engage the learner to independent thought. So Dewey was one of the pivotal influential people who helped us start to think that reading really was a critical thinking process and the result of meaning making with the individual and the text he or she was interacting with. We also base a lot of what we do in education, not just for reading, on developmental theories of learning. And these became more popular as modern psychology emerged. And these theories focused on patterns of growth or what patterns were being seen in individuals. So developmentalists such as G. Stanley Hall and Arnold Grell, they looked at patterns of growth for children. What they discovered was that children at various stages of development adopted various methods of coping to the world around them. Developmentalists also saw reading as sets of interrelated skills that differed with the task being presented and differed with the type of text being presented. So leveled reading programs were developed at this point in time that approached reading as a recursive skill. Such graded programs existed prior to the 20th century. The developmentalists shifted expectations for the reader based on developmental stages rather than approaching it as a uniformly developed skill. So this was the idea that individual students progressed at different varying levels based on their capabilities and achievement levels progressing through various skills. And you'll see, we'll take a look at a couple of developmental stages visuals near the end of this presentation. Psychology and reading. So it's interesting. I put a picture of the copy of David Kilpatrick's book, Essentials of Assessing, Preventing, and Overcoming Reading Difficulties. It was when I first read David Kilpatrick's book that I was awakened to the fact that most of what we know about reading and most of the research done on reading actually comes out of the field of psychology, not so much of education experts. And that was an awakening moment for me. Um, most of the research out there is completed by psychologists, not our educators. Researchers became deeply interested in the process of reading early on in the 20th century, and studies of eye movement actually dominated the field for quite a while, but now we know that reading deficits are most largely not due to any type of visual um, actions or visual renderings. There was an emergence of understanding that thinking is vitally linked to reading, and this idea is credited to, to Edmund Berkey Huey's work, The Psychology and Pedagogy of Reading, and that was published in 1908. While much of his work has since been discredited, his focus on thinking helped to shape later cognitive theories of reading. And if you're paying attention to what's being discussed currently in the field of education as related to reading, you'll you'll take quick notice that cognitive neuroscience is at the forefront of this and revealing to us decades worth of research that shows how important the simple view of reading is, how the brain rewires itself in terms of orthographic mapping to learn letter sound correspondences and also develop background knowledge and how important and pivotal that is in comprehension. It's really cognitive science now that is leading 
what we know about best practices for instructing and assessing reading. So continuing on with our historical journey, what we saw um, in addition to developmental stages being established and psychologists starting to study reading and reading difficulties, what also emerged was standardized testing. In 1905, French psychologists Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon created the first standardized test. This was a 20 item test to identify students unable to be successful in school. By 1914, the American version of Binet's test was published. And at about that same time, Edward Thorndike was developing standardized achievement tests in math, handwriting, spelling, drawing, reading, and language. These tests often included written responses and were tedious to administer and grade. The beginning of World War II and the U.S. military's need to efficiently assess two million recruits and, and be able to sort them by ability resulted in our first paper pencil version of an IQ test. So this groundbreaking idea of multiple choice questions, it was actually borrowed from the state of Kansas, came in the form of a silent reading test. Um, and this helped automatize and quickly decrease the time it took to grade tests. So for most intents and purposes, it was difficult to tell the difference between a reading comprehension assessment and intelligent tests. This also mirrors what was happening in the Industrial Revolution, where we saw much of our country's practices take on a factory-like mentality, a very streamlined um, assembly line mentality. This actually on your screen now in front of you is an item from an undated um, intelligence test, but we think it was around circa 1915. It was one of Thurston's intelligent tests, and he was um, considered a pioneer in intelligent testing. Free recall was used by a few researchers, though, to begin to look at comprehension itself. And these early studies on comprehension asked students to recall relevant words or ideas after silent reading. Time testing was designed to measure a student's speed at reading and completing tasks. So the thought was that you were a better comprehender the more you could recall something or remember something that you read. And time tests were used because the thought was the more quickly you were able to recall something, the better comprehender you were. Silent reading also emerged largely due to um, large class sizes and was seen as a more efficient way of instructing students as opposed to oral recitation. The emphasis on meaning making within the act of reading established reading to learn pedagogy and practices that are the foundation for later content. Cyrus Mead found that silent reading was superior to oral reading because such reading lended itself to getting the thought out which the writer wished to express. Thorndike disputed notions of reading as a simple habit, but said it was a weighing of many elements, including structure, content, and reading mindset. And this was in the um, early 1900s. So here again, we see the emergence of the idea of individuals interacting with text and making personal meaning from what they're reading, while at the same time considering the social context that or environment someone was exposed to and brought up in. Studies in the early 20th century began to attempt to determine the relationship between content area achievement with reading success. And early de studies demonstrated a high correlation between overall academic achievement and reading ability. So even as we were coming to understand what goes into the act of reading, we were also coming to see it as important for the content areas or disciplines of actual reading. This is another example test item from the 1970s, and this was a sentence verification task. 
uh, and it was considered a comprehension test. And these were developed in effort to better test comprehension from a cognitive and constructivist view. So examinees were given a sentence and asked to select an appropriate paraphrase. Each answer option included an appropriate paraphrase of the sentence with some semantic substitutes. So changing the meaning, but keeping most of the words and a sentence with very different meaning in words. In the 1930s and 40s, IBM invented scanners, and this dramatically reduced the cost of scoring standardized tests. Until this point, early SAT tests had been written tests, but now machine scorable multiple choice tests were largely seen as useful. New generation reading tests were now created in this format, with test makers focusing largely on two key skills researchers believe critical to comprehension, word knowledge and reasoning about reading. What emerged is statistical analysis that began to see whether skill subscores could be differentiated in their scores. For example, a 1971 study of the Iowa test of basic skills found that some skills were statistically independent, like listening comprehension, verbal reasoning, and reading and skimming speed, while others were not, such as paragraph meaning, cause and effect, reading for inferences, and selecting main ideas. In the 1950s, Wilson Taylor developed the closed procedure test as an alternative to conventional standardized tests, believing that this would help to eliminate what he perceived as test subjectiveness. A test designer simply deletes every number word in the passage, and the examinee is asked to fill in each close blank with a word that would make sense or add meaning to the paragraph. Since the introduction of this testing method, researchers have debated significant scoring questions, such as whether to allow synonyms to serve as correct answers, or if only content words read should be deleted from the passage. As cognitive theories of education took root in the 1980s, important questions emerged. For instance, reading educators began to understand the notion of background knowledge. And this begged the question, could students simply use their background knowledge and not their reading com comprehension to answer some questions? Others began to look at cultural bias and the impact on assessment data, especially in the light of achievement gaps between white and minority students. By the late 1980s, constructivist approaches to reading assessment began to emerge. These reformers sought new formats and new appropriates to the question of assessments. These assessments must address questions of prior knowledge, env environmental clues, the text itself, and the student as meaning maker. What emerged were assessments with longer text passages, more challenging questions, different question formats, such as the more than one correct answer format, and the use of authentic texts. Some reforms were not even visible to the teachers. Testing companies developed elaborate development processes in the hopes of addressing perceived deficits in testing. This idea of background knowledge, if you're interested in learning more, David Coleman, one of the writers of the Common Core Literacy Standards, speaks a lot about this and how important it is to reading comprehension. And there's several YouTube videos of him speaking on the topic of background knowledge and reading comprehension. So we left off in the 1980s, and this is also where classroom assessments took on a new importance. Retellings in the classroom setting became very important tools for assessing comprehension. Researchers practiced think aloud protocols that allowed researchers to understand a student's process of thinking. Variations included write along tasks that were used to allow assessors to see a student's thought process through the mandatory, man, mandatory notes. Fluency testing and also informal reading inv inventories, IRIs, were refined at this time and became important parts of reading assessment and identifying struggling readers. All right, now let's make sure you understand types of assessments and stages. So there's two models out there, a deficit model versus a conceptual model. The deficit model in education is largely outdated, and this is the belief that a student's difficulty resides within that child, that you identify what is wrong with that child and there's not much that you can do about it. It's a very fixed mindset approach. The conceptual model 
includes much more than the student's deficit. It is a broader perspective asking us to look at our schools as an institution, look at our pedagogy, look at exposure, all of those things that feed into a child's ability to learn and what he or she knows and is able to do. Okay, stages and conceptual models. Many researchers have put together stages of development and this helps to refine and determine how assessments look. Most contextual models also seek to understand a child's development. Several different stage models of assessment have been developed. This is a look at just one. It's one of the more famous ones. This is Jean Charles' model of reading stages. Using something such as this would allow a teacher to not only identify what a student can't do, but it also opens up a teacher's ability to understand what a teacher can do and should be working on as a prerequisite to the next skill. This is Spear, Swirling, and Stenberg stage model that seeks to demonstrate the ongoing relationship between discrete skills such as phonemic awareness, word recognition, and strategic reading. Skill gaps in the lower skills limit a student's ability to become highly proficient. And you'll see how these skills build upon one another and that there's multiple skills involved when we're talking about decoding and language comprehension. This stages of spelling development was produced by Bear and is used to assess what foundational skills might be lacking. You'll see a lot of repetition amongst these models. And another very famous one is Aries stages of reading development. If you're familiar with letters training, language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, a lot of the instruction that takes place there for teachers is a result of Aries stages of reading development. In the cognitive model, reading is composed of three separate components, automatic recognition of words, comprehension of the language in the text, and the ability to use strategies to achieve one's purpose in the text. So this is another great model. Again, now that cognitive neuroscience research is leading the field, you see in the middle just the importance of background knowledge as it relates to vocabulary and having knowledge of text and sentence structures and the different pathways that all need to come together to feed into total reading comprehension. Uh, just like our simple view of reading at the top, you've got phonics, decoding, down at the bottom, the strategic knowledge, um, and understanding, and those all have to come together. Scarborough's reading rope is a very famous image that also shows the breakdown of subskills for both word recognition and language comprehension. It's that more complex look at the simple view of reading, if you will, and this image also is presented in Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement. So, therefore, as reading teachers, practitioners, and assessors, we really have to be detectives. We have to consider why a reading problem is suspected. This would include looking at what is needed for reading to occur, but also looking at other things that can cause reading problems. Everything from emotional issues to difficulty testing, life problems outside of school. This all leads the assessor to consider what is needed for reading to occur. We also have um, present what is known as the Matthew effect, and this of course came out of a biblical reference, but it really shows that struggling readers fall further and further behind each year. This is backed by research, whereas efficient readers continue to develop at higher rates and become expert skilled readers. Um, often struggling readers don't understand how to employ a set of strategies to a reading purpose, and that's how they fall further and further behind because they don't get the automatic practice that skilled readers are getting. The Matthew effect goes hand in hand with leveled readers 
versus decodable readers. And so what we saw again in the 80s and the 90s was a large emphasis on using leveled readers in schools. What we see now from the research emerging, however, is that leveled readers actually can cause harm to students who are learning to read. Because what happens is a child is locked in, if you will, to a certain level. And oftentimes that level can be below grade level. So he or she then is not being exposed to grade level content, grade level vocabulary, uh, advanced sentence structure, and background knowledge. If this happens for multiple years in a row, the Matthew effect starts to come into play because the deficit continues to grow and our poor readers fall further and further behind. Some terms that you'll want to know, group versus individual tests. In individual tests, often oral responses are required and this allows for adaptive testing. Formal versus informal tests. So in informal tests, the teacher has latitude to interpret results in the testing method, whereas formal tests are rigid and there's little discretion on the part of the teacher. So a formal reading test would um, be something like uh, the Ohio error test, the state standardized test. And I would tend to believe that that is why several teachers don't like those formal tests. It's because that they don't have a lot of latitude or interpretation with those tests. Normed reference versus criterion reference tests. So in norm reference tests, we're looking at how the child performed when compared to other students. So we're looking at percentiles and stay nines and grade equivalents. A criterion benchmark test, however, is when there is a certain score or a certain amount that we're looking for a child to pass. So norm reference tests are those tests like star reading or map reading tests in which a child is being compared to other children, typically his or her same age. Criterion tests would be like, again, our state reading test in which the benchmark for passing is a certain number and we're asking students to meet or exceed that number. And then there's screening versus diagnostic tests. So in screening tests, uh, we're provided a broad defined estimate of overall achievement. Group achievement tests can sometimes serve as screening tests. Diagnostic tests, however, provide much more detailed information for planning. So common norms, percentile is typically one that most people understand and familiar with. Um, I can give you an example for a percentile rake, ranking. If the child scored at the 85th percentile, that means he or she scored better or higher than 85% of the other kids his or her same age. Stay nines are a little bit differently though. Um, they're not as specific as percentiles. They are still statistically equivalent, however, it, meaning it takes as much effort to move from the first to second stay nine as the second to the third stay nine. So the same amount of effort to move from stay nine to stay nine. The real difference between the two subsets of pre and post tests is two stay nines, and the difference is probably real. Um, I like to think of stay nines as fractions of a pie. So taking that whole and cutting it into um, typically five fractions or five pieces, and those would be the statistically significant scores and groups of that entire testing population. Grade equivalent scores are very popular, however, they're the most problematic. Um, it's not likely that a college student actually reads on a fifth grade passage used in the test. So when we say things like that college student is reading at a fifth grade level, we really want to call into um, play the accuracy of the test that that college student was given. Other important terms that um, we want to make sure you understand, one would be reliability, and reliability refers to the consistency of results. So if I gave this test, and then you gave this test, and then my brother gave this test, would we all get the same results? And what you'll see happening sometimes in, in schools or districts that I love is when teachers sit together and grade um, papers or assessments or responses anonymously to calibrate themselves and see if they're all grading the same. That's a really great practice to um, up the reliability of assessments. The problem is when practices like that don't exist and teachers are grading tests in isolation in their classroom, it's hard to 
really have reliability amongst all the classrooms and grade levels. Validity um, means, does the test measure what it actually says it does? Is it reflecting the taught curriculum? So we're looking to see, is the test designed in a way that's actually capturing what its intended use is? And that is it for today. Thank you for listening along and plugging away each week. If at any time, as always, you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks.